Welcome all of you to this live program at Authority Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Omar Bahari from Chicago, United States. Dr. Bahari is a fellowship free orthopedic surgeon affiliated to the Midwest Orthopedics at Rush University in Chicago, Illinois. Medical graduate of Rush Medical College, Dr. Bahari went on to complete his orthopedic surgery residency at the NYU Langone Orthopedic Hospital in New York. He then specialized in adult hip and knee reconstruction by completing his fellowship training at Ortho Carolina Hip and Knee Center in Charlotte. He has numerous peer reviewed publications and podium presentations and is an active member of the ARCUS. We are also joined by Dr. Neil Seth, who is an associate professor and chief of orthopedics at the Hospital for the University of Pennsylvania, and Dr. Loyal Khatib from Dubai. So today is my great honor to introduce Mr. Omar Bahari from Chicago. Over to you, Omar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Atej. That was a wonderful uh, and much appreciated introduction. Um, I'm Omar Bahari. I'm uh, coming to you here from live from uh, Chicago in the United States. Uh, I'm at Midwest Orthopedics at Rush, uh, where I do hip and knee reconstruction. Uh, it's my honor to be part of this uh, webinar today and uh, along uh, uh, some esteemed colleagues here. So uh, our, our topic today will be uh, custom triflange acetabular reconstruction for chronic pelvic discontinuity. And my only relevant uh, disclosure here would be uh, that I am working on a uh, acetabular revision uh, system design with uh, Onco Surgical, uh, but otherwise the others are uh, not relevant. Um, so, broadly speaking, you know, pelvic discontinuity is a very obviously challenging issue in uh, acetabular reconstruction, and it broadly just means dissociation of the inferior and in the in the superior hemi pelvis uh, due to the acetabular bone loss that has occurred. Uh, via one of multiple different mechanisms that can occur. Uh, it was very uh, uh, succinctly and, and, and descriptively uh, classified by Dr. Poprosky uh, and is also uh, captured in the AOS classification system, usually as a, a grade three Poprosky B uh, or, uh, or a grade four AOS uh, uh, category. Essentially, it'll typically involve about two centimeters of superior uh, medial or lateral migration with anterior and posterior column defects and medial wall absence. So you essentially you have this picture where you have dissociation of the inferior pelvic hemisphere from the superior hemisphere. Uh, they come in different types and they're not all created equal. Uh, and it's important to sort of uh, assess these on the preoperative radiographs and plan appropriately to get the uh, best sort of reconstruction. Uh, the, the, the degree of bone loss can wide vary, uh, you know, very, very widely between these cases. And the chronicity of the discontinuity itself can definitely have uh, big implications on in terms of what types of reconstructions may, may be favored. Um, the bone biology is also something I think is very important. Uh, irradiated bone, for example, may not have potential to ingrow. Uh, and, you know, may create a, a, another challenge along with the mechanics of, uh, of uh, discontinuity that a surgeon must face when they're planning the reconstruction. The, as you can see here, there's a lot of different options to treating chronic public discontinuity. Uh, and a lot of them were actually really nicely captured in this uh, lovely textbook that I had the honor of being part of. Uh, and our topic today will be sp focusing specifically on custom triflange reconstructions. So it's important to arrive to accurate diagnosis. Uh, so it starts with a, with a thorough history and physical exam in the office uh, and understanding the etiology of that discontinuity. So is this a wear and osteolysis case? Uh, is this a periprosthetic fracture that is an acute discontinuity? Or uh, if this is something that's due to adverse local tissue reaction from metallosis or taper corrosion? Uh, or is this uh, due to aseptic loosening, loosening of, of an acetabular component that has been ignored for years? Um, it's important to, things, that, things in the history that I think are very important to understand is any history of any pelvic uh, uh, or uh, abdominal cancers that required pelvic radiation. So things like endometrial cancer, colon cancer, how much radiation did they get? Did it include the whole pelvis? Uh, and, and this information may not always be readily available, but I think it's very important to understand if there's any radiation involved uh, so that you can understand the bone biology that you're likely to be dealing with. Uh, I start off with simple radiographs, typically an AP pelvis and Jude views of the pelvis to look at the columns. So uh, you can see here the top uh, two images are a iliac uh, uh, oblique and an obturator oblique images, and they basically show you um, the extent of the posterior and anterior column uh, bone loss. Uh, so it kind of it gives you a better sense of that. And I think it gives you most of the picture right there, and I think. Um, the next step for me is typically going to be using a CT scan, not only to assess the defect, um, but also potentially if I'm considering a custom implant design, which will typically rely on CT cuts. Uh, 
the things that I will request are typically going to be two millimeter uh, uh, slices of the CT scan and multiple reformats. So axials, coronal, sagittals, and usually a 3D reconstruction to kind of help um, uh, evaluate, uh, you know, both columns and in, in the direction of the uh, bone loss uh, and the available bone stock for the future reconstruction. Now, if you have a cup that's up and in and it's fairly migrated into the pelvis, one, one important consideration is, uh, you know, potentially considering a CTA to look at the proximity of the iliac vessels. You want to make absolutely sure that, you know, the hardware that you're about to remove, including any screws, if they're in intimate contact with any major vessels, then uh, that warrants uh, having vascular surgery on backup. So that's something I definitely always think about uh, in those settings. Uh, and obviously, always worth ruling out infection. Uh, if you're going to be uh, tackling any of these big cases and doing these reconstructions, you have to be absolutely sure that it's not infected because that definitely will guide you down a different path. Treatment usually a staged sort of operation where you try to tackle the infection first and then uh, return later for a reconstruction. So I think the biggest uh, pearls in planning that uh, Dr. Tom Faring taught me is uh, do not underestimate the degree of bone loss. Uh, so sometimes planar radiographs can some degree uh, underestimate the degree of osteolysis uh, or degree of bone loss. So it, it's important to have use all the tools and all the imaging you have available to be well prepared for this type of uh, uh, reconstruction. So you don't want any uh, surprises intraoperatively uh, when you when you're planning on on tackling this surgery, regardless of the method that you're using to uh, to address the the, uh, the, the defect. Uh, so I, I typically will uh, will get a, a CT scan. Uh, with a low threshold to, to make sure that I have the appropriate sort of assessment. So what are my indications for a custom triflangitis tabular component? Uh, well, chronic pelvic discontinuity is generally uh, right there, a, an indication for a lot of surgeons uh, doing uh, custom uh, implants. Um, I typically will heavily consider this as opposed to other techniques that rely on osteointegration in patients with significant history of radiation to the pelvis. Um, because I think in those situations, while you know, uh, porous tantalum shells and, and sort of cup cage uh, um, constructs and, and distraction technique have done actually really quite well. Um, in the setting of irradiation, it's a little bit less clear whether or not the bone will actually ingrow ultimately. So I, I have a little bit more concern in those patients and I will uh, have a lower threshold to proceed with a custom uh, triflange implant. Um, in general, like, you know, if, if for these types of uh, discontinuities, if you have you, for a triflange to, to achieve adequate fixation, you have to have inferior hemisphere um, bone stock for fixation. Sometimes it's compromised with osteolysis uh, in the ischium, but uh, but it's worth definitely uh, having. You know, I think it's mandatory having inferior hemisphere fixation, whether it's in the pubis or the ischium, for your triflange to actually uh, not uh, potentially uh, fail in abduction. Uh, and in those. In those situations where you may not have any bone stock at all uh, in the inferior hemisphere, then other techniques may be a little bit more uh, um, pertinent here, so, including like the ice cream cone pedestal and so forth. So I think a CT scan eliminates a lot of the guesswork. Uh, it allows you to understand um, the way you're going to approach the hip as you're uh, uh, dislocating and, uh, and as you're removing components and how you're going to dissect through. Uh, it also, uh, in the setting of significant um, superior medial migration in Kaprosky 3B defects, um, I routinely will get a CTA to make sure that the iliac vessels are not in close proximity. And ultimately, even if you're not using a custom implant, you can certainly use a CT scan to sort of plan your fixation uh, construct, whether it's a cup cage or a uh, cup and two augments or an augment, uh, you can certainly uh, better understand where the bone is and where your screws are going to have to end up being to get good fixation. Um, but ultimately, uh, if you're doing a custom implant, you'll, you'll typically have to get a CT scan um, with a certain protocol to be able to actually design the implant here, as you can see in the, on the bottom right. Uh, the imaging protocols for those can vary widely depending on manufacturer, uh, but they're typically going to be like two millimeter cuts with different reformats and a 3D recon. Uh, you obtain the CT scan, you send it to the manufacturer, they come up with, the engineering team comes up with a uh, draft plan uh, to initiate the design, and then you communicate back and forth with the engineers, which is a really important part of the actual um, planning for the surgery, to make sure that you have the right implant that you're going to need uh, to address the issue. Uh, and uh, ultimately, you finalize the design and then the, the uh, implants are made. So how do we plan these? I think there's a lot of different aspects that need to be considered. So. I think surgical uh, approach will heavily dictate what your implant design is going to be. 
so if you're doing, if you're comfortable with an extensile anterior approach and you prefer to do this type of uh, reconstruction from, a, from an extensile anterior approach, your flanges are not going to sit quite the same as an implant design for a posterior approach because of the, the part of the outer table that you're uh, uh, resting the flange on is going to be actually different. So same with the ischium as well. You're accessing different parts of the ischium depending on the approach. Uh, so the flange position is going to heavily widely. So this is something that you're going to have to discuss with the engineers uh, and let them know what approach you're, you're uh, planning. Uh, the screw angles actually are a big big part of this as well. So um, if you're doing this in a posterior approach, for example, you may want to consider uh, your iliac screws coming at a little bit more of an oblique angle going uh, um, distal to proximal so that you you can more readily, more easily drill these screw holes as opposed to ones that are going a little bit more transverse where you have to retract more vigorously against the abductors and risk the superior gluteal uh, nerve vascular bundle. So the angle of the screws actually um, is something you want to consider to facilitate uh, insertion of these screws at a reasonable working length, but uh, with less dissection and less uh, less aggressive retraction against the superior gluteal nerve vascular bundle. Uh, the number of screws is a consideration, um, at least three ischial, preferably six if you can get that, if you have the bone stock. At least six on the iliac side, sometimes longer if you have a bigger segmental uh, area of, of bone loss. Uh, and the pubic screw, if there's bone stock there as well, it definitely certainly would help biomechanically to have triradiate uh, tri fixation between ischium, pubis, and ilium. Uh, and that would be something you want to consider in your design as well. Um, we talked about the screw angles. Uh, locking screw options can be very uh, helpful from a biomechanical perspective. Um, if this is a case where it's an irradiated discontinuity, such as the one on the right there, uh, where you have concerns about um, getting any osseointegration on the back of the implant that you're designing with a porous layer, then ultimately you're going to be relying pretty heavily on your screw fixation for long term. Uh, and you may want to consider using locking screw technology if it, if it exists for the uh, manufacturer designing your uh, implant. Uh, the hip center uh, matters as well. So you got to be careful to uh, not overestimate how much normal hip center you can restore. Uh, in a case that's been chronically migrated superiorly, you may have a very hard time uh, if you plan a very low um, hip center. Uh, you may have a very hard time actually getting uh, the hip to reduce ultimately when you place the implant. So that's the consideration you're going to have to make and decide on what your hip center is going to be to maximize stability, but also um, not making it, make it impossible for you to actually um, achieve reduction at the end of the case. Um, the ultimate thing here is that you, you're you going to want to pick a hip center that is not too lateralized either. So it doesn't um, increase the risk of um, abduction failure. Um, but you're, but you're, you're going to want to be have a hip center that's also at a reasonable offset so that you uh, can maximize your stability. Uh, the inner part of the shell, depending on the manufacturer, can potentially have a modular locking mechanism. Um, and if you're able to place it in such a way where you have uh, adequate antiversion and adduction targets, uh, you may be able to uh, lock the liner in, uh, or you may have an inner part of the implant that is uh, cementable and where you cement a modular cup or uh, a monoblock dual mobility cup or a constrained liner, depending on, on uh, what you're trying to solve in terms of uh, risk of instability. But the key thing is to maximize head size and minimize risk of instability because, they, as you'll see later on, it's one of the biggest uh, uh, complications that can happen. Um, it's key to communicate with the engineers. This is going to be a lot of back and forth emails and iterations of the design. But you have to realize that, they, you know, you're ultimately going to be doing the surgery. and You have to know exactly. Uh, you have to maximize your chances of success in terms of the construct. So, it's you know, it's, it's going to be upon you to uh, communicate heavily with the engineers. So how long do you, does it take, typically take to do this? That's been historically one of the issues with, uh, you know, getting a custom implant for, uh, to deal with a discontinuity uh, case. Uh, it's gotten a little bit better over time. Currently, it takes probably about a week or two from when you evaluate the patients to get the CT scan and send the CT scan out to the engineering team to get a uh, design uh, and then work on planning. And if you're diligent, you communicate quickly and they have the engineering team that um, efficiently works through the process, then... Ultimately, after designing the uh, implant, it probably takes about two weeks to get the acrylic models to uh, look at in the office um, and, uh, and another five to six weeks to get the full implant. So the total time for me takes about six to eight weeks, but I recognize this is at you know a tertiary academic center and maybe there's, there's some advantage in, in getting those a little bit quickly there. Uh, and it may not be always possible uh, where, where you are. Uh, so as far as surgical technique, 
it's just key to use a familiar extensile approach. So uh, for me, you know, I, I do a post order approach for this. Um, you know, there's a lot of surgeons I don't respect uh, that are phenomenal and can do this through an extensile anterior approach and they're more comfortable that way. Uh, and I think ultimately you just have to use the, the approach that you feel like is better. Uh, the one on the right, there's an anterior approach, tri flange. The one on the left is a posterior lateral approach, tri flange. Um, key thing is to do this safely, do this accurately. Uh, and you have to use whatever tools uh, in terms of approach that you're good at. Uh, as far as surgical technique, you start with component removal, wide uh, uh, debridement of any fibrous tissue that is around the rim and uh, and around the columns that, that doesn't allow you to see uh, the extent of your bone loss or any bone that you need to remove to ultimately fit the triflange implant. This is a little bit different than when you're doing a case with a distraction technique, where sometimes you don't want to leave some of the fibrous tissue uh, and membrane, in the, especially in the medial aspect of the columns, uh, in order to actually facilitate the distraction and not make it a little bit harder to get uh uh, fit of the cup. Uh, so you ultimately assess the, uh, the defect, you test for his discontinuity. I like to take a cob and push on the issue and see how much mobility you have in between uh, the inferior and superior hemispheres. Uh, there is one case I recall about a year ago where it was a chronic discontinuity and um, just barely a discontinuity. And ultimately um, we had modeled for a custom implant. And when we went in, we, uh, uh, realized that actually over time the columns had healed. She hadn't ambulated for a while and her columns had fully healed. Uh, and she was essentially left with a 2C defect that we ended up solving with uh, uh, medial augments and a hemispherical cup. So uh, I still like to examine and make sure we confirm what we're seeing on the images is consistent with what we have uh, intra-op before uh, placing the implant. So the next step is um, you're going to want to make sure the implant fits. And this is sometimes the part that uh, can be iterative and takes a little bit longer depending on uh, the, the exposure and the, uh, the degree of bone you have to remove. Uh, in most cases, this you'll be using a burr to uh, sort of uh, remove any bone uh, that is indicated on the plan to allow you to fit the uh, acrylic model of the implant. Uh, and you can iteratively do that until you, you're happy with how the uh, acrylic model fits. And then you can open the implant and then you can ultimately rotate the implant in uh, and, and position it. Um, you know, you, you certainly can apply medial cancellus allegory uh, chips and, and uh, reverse ream them to you know obtain some sort of uh, medial graft that could be structurally a little bit supportive. As far as potential for ingrowth, uh, you know I think the, the, that's a little bit controversial. I think uh, ultimately a lot of this bone will not probably incorporate, but you can certainly you can certainly consider doing that for um, additional structural medial support. And you're probably going to be talking on the order of for these defects. You're going to be talking on the order of like 160 to sometimes 200 uh, cc's of cancellous chips. Um, some other manufacturers, uh, instead of the burring technique, they may have like a custom reaming guide that you can use to maybe potentially more efficiently move through the process of uh, preparing the cavity for the uh, custom implant. Um, this is a video here showing an insertion of the implant. Um, so typically you're going to end up, this is from a posterior lateral approach, you're going to be uh, inserting the iliac flange underneath the abductors, um, and then you can rotate the uh, ischial flange in until it rests in the appropriate position. Uh, and same with the uh, with the pubic flange. At this point, I typically like to just confirm that I can actually get uh, within striking range with the trunnion and be able to potentially obtain the reduction. Um, if not, then then at least it clues me in on how much more releasing and potentially uh, soft tissue structures such as the iliopsoas and so forth to be able to actually get down uh, and reduce the uh, the uh, the hip ultimately when you're done fixing the implant. Um, we start usually with ischial fixation first. Uh, if the bone quality is poor, you can use you can inject cement into the screw holes after after you drill the the holes, uh, and um, and then insert the screw over them to to, to add uh, sort of a locking mechanism, if you will, or a little bit more pull out strength. Um, but if you have an implant that has locking screws, that's also a great option to uh, potentially increase your biomechanical advantage in, in osteolytic bone, especially on the ischial side. Uh, we start with initial fixation first, and then uh, I reduce the iliac flange typically to the outer table uh, using a ball spike pusher from a pelvic trauma set. Um, and uh, then I anchor the iliac flange uh, with, with a non-locking iliac screw first, um, ultimately. And then I typically at that point will check a film to make sure I like the hip center position, the implant position, and the screw trajectories before I uh, proceed with filling the rest of the screw holes. Uh, I think sometimes... Um, Depending on how your fit was, uh, if you if you it, it, there can be some subtle subtleties in how the implant actually rests on the bone, and your planned screw trajectories may ultimately not end up being perfectly to your plan. Uh, 
And you have to recognize that. And, and x-ray can be helpful in doing that. Or, But also any screw hole that you drill, you should be using a, a depth gauge to uh, check for perforation um, instead of just relying on the uh, on uh, complete assumption that the implant is resting perfectly to your plan. Because there certainly can be differences. Uh, at the end of it, uh, at the end of the screw insertion, you uh, will at that point, if you have a modular liner, you can put a trial liner in, um, and and um, you can trial and check for stability. Uh, and ultimately, you can uh, impact your final liner. If you have a, a modular locking mechanism, then great. Then you can ultimately, and, and the cup is in a good position, or the uh, the um, diameter of the uh, the inner diameter of the uh, implant uh, is in an appropriate antiversion and abduction position. Then you can ultimately. Uh, uh, lock your, your fine liner in versus cementing any um, a large diameter liner or a du monoblock dual mobility cup or cement a line, uh, constraint liner. Post-operative protocol, um, I typically tend to restrict some weight bearing depending on on uh, the degree of fixation of the screws and degree of osteolysis. Um, there is potential for osteointegration on the back of these implants. Uh, you typically, the back of the implants on the iliac side and on the ischial side at least, We'll have a porous uh, structure there. So there's potential for osteointegration, and I like to min minimize the amount of micro motion early on. Uh, so I'll typically restrict weight bearing for a you know, period of 8 to 12 weeks sometimes. Um, there's also potential for discontinuity healing. It's not a requisite aspect for this to work, uh, but it is certainly something that is a welcome corollary. Um, and I think there's more potential sometimes if you do restrict their weight bearing. But if you have an older uh, patient who uh, needs to be mobilized a little bit quickly and because they're getting deconditioned, then you may consider uh, leg and weight bearings tolerated off the bat. Uh, I definitely use, utilize uh, hip precautions widely um, in order to minimize the risk of dislocation early on. And I typically uh, employ a two-week uh, oral antibiotic, uh, extended oral antibiotic prophylaxis to minimize the risk of infection as well. These are some examples of uh, what these constructs can look like and the type of defects around them. Uh, and ultimately, I think, uh, you know, planning the hip center is pretty critical and keeping it uh, not excessively lateralized uh, and then also targeting your your iliac uh, and your, your ischial flanges to appropriate position for good, robust uh, screw fixation. Um, this has been published on several times at this point, and uh, we have a complete review of the literature in our book chapter. Um, but this is, you know, this is a study here on 57 patients with a 65 month mean follow up. Um, you know, 98% free of, uh, of aseptic loosening, uh, and 80% of these implants in that period of time were stable and had a heal discontinuity, which is a, you know, pretty good outcomes for, uh, you know, short to midterm follow-up. Um, this is a 20 year period here study out of the Anderson clinic, 50 patients, minimum two year follow-up where their, um, air hip score is improved, uh, overall higher complication rate, uh, as with other studies, uh, 28%, mostly dislocation and infection. Uh, this is a midterm study here uh, published by Dr. Uh, Faring. This is from two centers, uh, 73 uh, patients, minimum five-year follow-up, 40% uh, indicated for revision, mostly for instability and infection. Uh, there was only one loose implant. Uh, the clinical outcome scores overall were fairly high on a median. And this is a systematic review on all the articles published out there. Uh, uh, this is pu uh, published by, at HSS in uh, 17 articles, 579 cases, uh, overall, all cause revision free survivorship about eighty three percent. Again, low low rate of loosening overall as a lot as with a lot of these studies, but the complication rate again in the high twenty percent um, up to thirty percent here uh, uh, proportion with mostly again dislocation and infection being the biggest two culprits. So I'll, I'll stop here. I hope this was informative, and, and I'm happy to take any questions uh, regarding this. Thank you, Omar, for this Chris presentation. Omar, you can stop sharing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Omar, for this beautiful overview of uh, complex acetabular reconstruction. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, Omar, a few questions. Now, mm -hmm. you mentioned there are different forms of fixation, right? For example, I hosted Neil before, and uh, someone who's entering into the arena of hip surgery. You have like jumbo cage, cup cage, distraction plating, anti protrusive cage, ice cream cone. So how do you place each one? Where do, which category of patient fits into each? 
that's a that's a great question and that's exactly what every surgeon will have to decide sort of early on and and these are all wonderful techniques and they all have actually great outcomes and you know with similar profiles of complications of dislocation and uh and infection being the main culprits but i will say uh for me at least what helps me decide on when to use a custom implant versus a cup cage versus a distraction technique for me the biggest thing is if it's a discontinuity with uh an irradiated pelvis then i automatically go to a custom implant and the reason for that is um the data on, that we have on highly porous shells um uh, in irradiated bone actually quite good for like a porous tantalum shell but that's been published on mostly not in the setting of discontinuity i think if you're in the discontinuity setting you're fighting two things mechanics biomechanical environment the biggest problem and also biology with the irradiation. I think if you find those two things, I think you're potentially asking a little too much of a, um, uh, of a biologic potential construct. Uh, so that's, those are the cases where I automatically will go to a custom implant. Um, that being said, I think there's a lot of discontinuities where I, uh, you know, if, if I come across a discontinuity that I think has good biologic potential, the patient's on the younger side um, and may benefit from osteointegration then I consider doing a cup cage um, uh, or distraction technique without question. So for the CTAC, the best indication would be when you have an irradiated pelvis, right? Yes, a discontinuity of an irradiated pelvis, correct. And for and, me at least. Uh, yeah, and Omar, see what, if you look at data from historically, I mean, the complication rates for the CTACs were quite high, right? So maybe in the last mm -hmm. five to six years, the publications show, okay, reduced complications with the CTACs. Now, why has been that difference? Is it because of better understanding of the biology of, I mean, and the better OC integration with these implants? Uh, well, I think, I mean, I still think like the highest complications are not necessarily loosening. Uh, if you look at the literature, um, yeah, the technology of porous surfaces on these implants have gotten better. There's more locking screw options and, and so forth. So, in general, as a construct, the loosening rates are not really the main issue, but the, the dislocations and infections, um, I think people are becoming a little bit more aggressive with uh, antibiotic prophylaxis and and, uh, and also uh, on the um, stability side, having uh, more wide use of, of monoblock dual mobility constructs and uh, more emphasis on large diameter heads uh, has probably helped a lot with the dislocation side of things. I still think the complications rate is a little high and it leaves a lot to be desired, um, but as is the case with a lot of these complex reconstructions. But, um, you know, I think the... In these situations, I think the, um, the, and that's why there's a lot of different techniques on how to do this. There's no good answer, you know? So let's take Neil's point of view as well with CDAs. Yeah, thanks, Hitesh. And <clears throat> number one, uh, Omar, thank you so much for that review. I think that was a, that's probably the best review I've heard about custom triflanges thank you. because I think these are complicated. Thank these you. are not easy. Uh, and even if that's the choice and you've got a nice model and, actually implanting these are not that mm -hmm. simple. And like you mentioned agree. in the middle of your talk that, you know, your bone pattern could be two millimeters off from what your acrylic model mm -hmm. looks like. And now this thing is sitting in a completely different location. So 100%. that 60 millimeter screw that you planned for now is heading in yeah. a very bad direction. Um, so, you know, Hitesh, like this is actually, and so number two, I want to say thank you so much for writing the chapter in our textbook. I mean, I think this was a very, very good chapter, and I've gotten a lot of feedback from around surgeons around the world who have looked at it because they're looking at custom implants, and this has given them a roadmap, right? It's given them an idea of how to go about it, how to implant it. There's got a short video to to give them some uh, some guidance, and I think take away some of the anxiety on doing some of these cases. Uh, and Hitesh, like you know, you're question is actually really important like how do you choose there's 19 different ways to do this and this was really the impetus for putting this together because i was at a uh, at a conference with wayne paproski and i said you know i know what you think about i know what i think about because i trained with you so i'm biased i said but there are 15 different ways that we can do this maybe we should consolidate this in one place so that people have a choice to say let me look at this case and maybe it's better to do a cup cage or maybe it's better to do a custom implant maybe i can do distraction maybe a uh, you know, a jumbo cup with modular augment. So it's nice to have those different options and understand. You know, I think one of the things, um, Pitesh, if I were to summarize this, I think all the techniques have a couple of things that are very, very, I think, fundamental to all of them, right? Omar showed us exposure is critical. I don't care if you're going in from the front side or back, your exposure has got to be really wide and extensile to be able to see what you're doing and making sure you're putting your construct in the right spot. 
Number two, getting good mechanical fixation of whatever implant you're putting in is really critical, especially as I think the whole world has moved towards cementless fixation for these, right? So you need to make sure you have good mechanical stability to enhance your ability to, uh, to achieve biologic fixation. And the other thing is you have to get fixation in the inferior half of the acetabulum or in the hemisphere. Like you have to be in the ischium or the pubis or something inferiorly to prevent that abduction failure. Um, you know, my thoughts, Omar, again, you know, because your current boss is my former boss in, in training and my brain has been formulated from where you live now. Um, and I've, you know, in 14 years, I've never put in a cage. I've never put in a custom implant. And I've only done yeah. off-the-shelf implants, and I've done a bunch of these cases because these are my favorite cases to do. I think the biggest complication rate for custom implants or custom triflanges is instability. And I think it's because there's probably inadvertent injury to the neurovascular bundle, the superior mm -hmm. neurovascular bundle. Mm -hmm. Because even if you see it, even if you mobilize the abductor, there's no way yeah. you're getting that flange up there. Um I have actually changed my technique in the last year to now, instead of doing a posterior approach, I'm doing a, a uh, extensile Gibson approach or an extended mm -hmm. Adelaide approach where I come a little bit forward, a little more anterior on my G-Max and take G-Max down as a full sleeve instead of splitting it. And what that allows me mm -hmm. to do is it allows me to see the entire abductor mass and I actually find the superior neurovascular bundle. And I put a vessel loop around it. And now when I mobilize or anteriorly translate the femur, I can see how much tension is on there. And God forbid, I got to put an augment or something up on the ilium. I know exactly where it is. And I know exactly how much tension I'm putting on it. Um, I'm at the point where now I actually did a case just recently, about three months ago, where I did an intraoperative EMG and I put a probe in the gluteus medius. And during different parts of either taking down the G-max or anteriorly or dislocating the hip, translating the femur, and there were no spikes <clears throat> on the EMG. When I did it with a posterior approach, there were spikes during all of those times. So now I'm looking to do a, a yeah. you know, a, a perspective study of like Gibson approach versus posterior approach, because I think a lot of us had inadvertently injured that neurovascular bundle because you're trying yeah. to get into a place where in order to put any device, you're going to put some stretch on it or do something to that nerve. Thanks, Neil. Uh, Neil, we are also joined by Loy. Loy Al Khatib is an orthopedic surgeon based in Dubai. Loy, welcome to the show. Any questions to Omar? Hi, good evening and good morning, everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks, Omar, for this uh, great talk. So, I'm a sports medicine surgeon, shoulder, do shoulders and knees. For me, this is a big, big topic, super complex <laughs> topic. But uh, I would think if, do you think that there's a place to add? A computer navigation to the while you implant uh, this custom made uh, implants that may give you more accurate positioning of these implants. Yeah, it's an interesting topic actually. Um, uh, on this project that we're working on here, uh, uh, I'm working with this company on this ASTAB revision project, and and um, it was one of the things that were brought up. The the issue is it's not a bad idea in terms of like actually positioning of an implant like that. Um, the though the fact still remains um, how to prep the bone to fit the implant at the right position. I mean you're dealing you're dealing with a pretty massive area of bone loss and irregular bone surface and a lot of fibrous tissue that you have to debris that's not visible on the CT scan. Uh, that uh, a lot of times it's still uh, ultimately. Um, Really, what you're going to care about the most is host bone uh, apposition to the implant for mechanical advantage and potential for osseointegration. integration. Um, I don't think it's a bad idea at all. I think it's actually, you know, uh, something worth exploring. Um, but it's just, I think from a uh, doing it sort of uh, perspective, ultimately, you're, you're still confined by, you know, your iterative um, preparing of the bone to get the implant to fit in exactly. Uh, with good enough apposition on the bone for uh, appropriate fixation, but also uh, uh, for uh, for potential for uh, ingrowth. Thanks, Omar. Uh, Thanks, Neil, for joining us today as well. And Omar, yeah, Lloyd, thank uh, you so much. Yeah, and Omar and Neil, uh, I just want to get your perspective on. Uh, see, some of these patients have severely osteoporotic bone, right? So, do you give them cherry parotide and build the bone stock, and then operate? Uh, I did not. I, you know, I think a lot of the, the timeline of when I see a patient like that and the timeline of when they want something done about it, uh, I just don't think from a clinical perspective, it'll make that much of a difference. Um, 
not to mention the uh, some of the bone losses, not strictly because of osteopenia, which is definitely a very common thing in this population, but uh, maybe due to other things like adverse tissue reaction or osteolysis and so forth. And Neil, your perspective? Yeah, great point. You know, so just like Omar said, I don't think we have the, the lead time to be able to give them the medication ahead of time. I'm actually working with uh, the company that makes a baloparatide, you know, similar to teriparatide, um, on coming up with a way whether we can, if you treat one of these patients, regardless of what cementless device you put in, if I treat them post-operatively and put them on the two-year like plan to do whatever they need to do by injections, can that enhance their bone quality? Will that enhance the the rate at which bone is actually forming and getting in growth? Um, we don't know the answer yet because I'm sure on the strategic front for these companies, they'd like to have another FDA indication of why you should be able to use this medication. I wanted to make one other comment. Loy, your question was actually very, very good because I think it's in part and parcel to what Omar was saying, right? I think putting in these devices is very challenging. And if your bone pattern changes slightly, now this device is in the wrong spot. So the one question is, how do you prepare the bone so that it accepts your device perfectly? And the problem, I think, with the CT scans that you get preoperatively is that's assuming that you're not going to lose one spicule of bone addition to what you mm -hmm. think you have right now. And that is not clinically sometimes even possible. So I think the hard part is, Omar, is how do you know you put this huge chunk of metal and you can't see behind mm -hmm. it and you're assuming it's sitting perfectly, but it's hard to fine tune that one or two millimeters. Loy, I think that technology that we have available today would be able to help you screw map to say you put this in here, you're getting a live image robotically or navigationally, and now I have a probe that shows me that that 70 millimeter screw is only 30 millimeters because you're off angle a little bit, right? Or this is making contact here, mm -hmm. but there are some additional points where this is not sitting down perfectly, where you may need to burr out a little bone which is slightly different than the pre-op acrylic model that you come up with. So exactly. There is a way to put this together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we, say, we face the same problem when we're implanting shoulder, when using PSI, mm -hmm. patient-specific implants. I think the, the, the solution for shoulders is to have a great exposure. You need really to have a good, good exposure. And that will give you more like the, the positioning of your implant will be more, much more accurate. I would say that may be applied the same to the hip uh, joint. Agreed. And uh, Neil and Omar, yeah. one, one question uh, that's come up is, uh, since we are discussing robotics and navigation, so what has been the trend in the U.S. among the ARCA surgeons to use navigation or robotics for hips, primary hips? Primary knees, of course, there's an explosion of use. And what about in the hips? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's certainly uh, been, a, uh, you know, Neil probably feels the same way. I think there's definitely been a, a large growth in that in the hip, on the hip side. Uh, you, the use of technology in general, um, like you said, uh, you know, with robotics or navigation or even, you know, fluoroscopy and kind of, I think there's been a lot more of that uh, trend here in the United States with um, uh, with a lot of surgeons uh, sort of wanting to employ uh, available technology to maybe make the outcomes better and, and the recovery faster and so forth. Uh, you know, I think uh, definitely been a lot of that. I think most young surgeons at least use some sort of technology when they do a primary hip. And Neil, yeah, you take I agree, on I agree. Uh, for these primaries? Yeah, I agree with that. So I think that one of the other things that's happened simultaneously, Hitesh, is that definitely in the United States, the rate of people doing primary hips through an anterior approach has increased significantly. And as a result, the easiest enabling technology that you can add to that is the use of fluoroscopy, right, which you didn't use routinely for a posterior approach or a direct lateral approach, especially with the patient in a lateral decubitus position. So that I think helped enabling technology to start. Now there's just so many other levels, right? There's things where you can use like grids to help get your position of your components. And then you can get to the point of robotics where you can start putting in pins and get your leg length offset, get your cup position, do impingement modeling. I, I think definitely the younger generation has been, um, much more in tune to that. Uh, we are starting to see a trend. We're seeing people coming in, applying for fellowships that have never done a manual knee before, have not done a, a you know, a total hip replacement without an, some sort of enabling technology, which frightens me, frightens me a little bit because if your technology goes down, you got to still be able to do the procedure. Can't just shut, the, you know, close up and send the patient away. Um, so I think it's important, I think, for our trainees to learn both. 
learn how to do this manually, look how to use enabling technology to fine tune your tendencies. Uh, but I think there's been a little bit more of an explosion, I think, on the tech side in general, uh, maybe more so than there should be, because the data right now is not showing that much difference, right? It's saying that's drastically better than what we're doing manually. So it'd be interesting to see. So the, all these guys should be well-versed with a conventional one, right? So unless your principles are sound, you can't improvise on you know, Omar, I don't know if you were there, but uh, Loy and Hitesh, uh, three years ago, I had to give a talk at AUKUS with a panel of on mm -hmm. why I still use conventional instruments for primary total knees. And there was eight guys on the panel, all these people that I know that are all consultants for different robotic and, you know, technology companies. And I had my last slide was very simple. It was a video of Sully Sullenberger landing an airplane in the water, right, in the, in the Hudson <laughs> River. And the only reason he did that is because he flew airplanes for four yeah. years. And the computer told him to go back to one of three airports. And he's like, it's not going to work. And when the <laughs> NTSB looked at their like simulation, they had to go through 17 <laughs> simulations before they figured out how to land. So I'm like, That's there's classic. some. I, yeah, I said, I was like, I think that the analogy of this is critical. I'm not anti-technology, but if you're going to use it, it's fine. But you need to know Again. how to fly the airplane yeah. right, without technology that's true okay so that's the best way yeah. to conclude neil yeah beautiful <laughs> yeah i agree <laughs> yeah thank you omar and neil uh, it's been a wonderful thank you guys session. very much and i hope thank you this book has taken uh, to a totally new level and people it's, all over the world are going through that because that's yeah an it's, 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 this has been really great right um it's been really great thank you so much for the promotion of this i mean again happy to do this with any other chapter mm -hmm. that you think that are going to be great but uh you know, Omar, we literally picked a handful of chapters that we might go through, mm -hmm. which I think are the most popular things, right? Cupcake or Triflam. I mean, yeah, those yeah. are things that people are going to want to know. And I think the audience that this show um, will get to are the people that I'm getting random text messages from to say, hey, I got a case tomorrow. The nice thing, Hitesh, is like my wife yeah. on Friday night, like I'll get some random message and she'll like, I know it's some surgeon who's probably eight or 10 hours away yeah. from now. They're probably about to do this case. Like, I'm going to go take my contacts out, like call this guy back, whoever it is. <laughs> and she's right. Every time it's somebody like who's about to do one of these cases. That's and, awesome. Um, the nice thing is this book has literally sold out every meeting that we've gone to. And there's a lot of people that have been buying it. They're already looking at trying to come up with a second edition. In and the next now so, so. we're going to have a huge competition because this online version is going to be more popular. The webinars. I think, I yeah, think you exactly. can show the book online. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, the book I mean, is online. You have it. Show it, show no, it to the audience. No, the, the guys are going to watch only the YouTube ones, YouTube videos that we host. <laughs> oh, so, yeah, exactly. exactly. There you go. Dubai, they can know about it. Great. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, bye bye to all of you, and it's been a great pleasure. And Eid Mubarak to Thank all you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you.